The Travel Transformation Podcast is proud to be partnered with Give the Goodness Global, an amazing global outreach project helping families in need all over Southeast Asia and beyond. Please check them out at instagram.com forward slash give the goodness global today. And now on to the podcast episode. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation, exploring the life-changing potential of solo travel, intentional travel, and location-independent working. Whether you're an aspiring digital nomad or simply wish to boost your confidence through epic travel experiences, I'm here to motivate and inspire you to go after all your wildest dreams. I'm Jessica Grace Coleman, author, certified travel coach, founder of the Travel Transformation Company, and your host for the Travel Transformation Podcast. Travel changed my life. Now let's change yours. You ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Travel Transformation Podcast, where we talk all things travel and all things transformation. My name is Jessica Grace Coleman, and I'm your host. And today I'm talking to head financial coach and owner at Money Life Mentor, Brooke Tomasetti. Brooke is also the director of financial education at a startup called Carbon Collective. She helps young professionals unlock 20 to 40% of their income so they can travel a life with increased freedom, flexibility, and in most cases, travel. In this episode, we discuss the eight years Brooke has spent as a location-independent remote worker, her love of house hacking, slow travel, and staying in co-living houses, the FIRE movement, financial independence retire early, how to balance long-term financial goals with the desire to travel, And there's much, much more. So let's get straight to the interview. Hi, Brooke. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. No problem. Okay, so to start with, please, can you give me and our listeners a bit of background info about you? So where you're from, what you do, and a little bit about your story so far. Absolutely. So I work as a financial coach. I own my own company. It's called Money Life Mentor. And I'm also the director of financial education at a startup called Carbon Collective. And so I help young professionals figure out how to best use the income that they have coming in every month. But I think the interesting thing about my professional life is that I've aligned it in a way that matches with my values around freedom and location independence and travel. So I've been working fully remotely for eight years now, which has allowed me to experience a lot of the world and just have kind of different things and try new things that I don't think I would have had I not been fully remote. Mm, I love that so much. I'm all about freedom, location, independence, all that great stuff. So I'm going to ask you about the financial side and your business and things in a bit. But first of all, let's talk travel, because as you said, you've been remote for quite a while. So you obviously travel a lot. And I know you've tried lots of different types of travel as well. So can you tell me, maybe for people who don't that they're maybe not aware of all the different types of travel that you can do these days. Can you tell me the types you've done and do you have a favorite type yourself? Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because everyone I talk to has different names for like different sorts of of travel and like different kinds of ways to go about creating the lifestyle. But for me, yeah, so I've done a lot of different things. Something that I tried for a few years that was very successful and I was very happy with it was When I was, I think I was 25 years old, I bought a three unit investment property in my home country in the US, in Rhode Island. And what I did was I rented that out while I was traveling. And again, this was before real estate prices have been a little crazy the last couple of years, of course, but that allowed me to really cover my monthly living expenses at home, right? Because a lot of folks, the difficulty with travel is that they have this mortgage payment that they need to cover, but they also like having a place to come back to in their home country. So I did that for a few years and I usually call that house hacking. So it's kind of the term that I like to use. So that's something that I tried where I was traveling for more than six months out of the year. And then I also had like my room in my little unit to kind of come back to, which was really nice. And during that time and now really the last few years, I've also done some co-living experiences. So becoming part of a community in another country usually for one to two months at a time in my case. So I've done that in a few different places, including Belize once. So co-living, house hacking, let's see what else. The last three years I've been fully location independent. So 
doing more of the, what I like to call kind of slow travel, where I'm staying somewhere for at least one to two, usually three or four months at a time. And I found that to be a really good balance because it it lets me really kind of experience like the day-to-day living, the culture, all the food, all of those kinds of things that make travel so rewarding. And I would say slow travel is really my favorite where I'm going somewhere for two, three months at a time, renting an apartment. And then what I've found is that I do like having a home base to come back to. So I've actually recently transitioned to finding a home base back here in the States as my really like that, that spot where I'm also building an in-person community here and making those connections for a few months out of the year. Yeah, totally agree with that. I'm the same and I'm in a similar kind of position at the moment in that I love traveling. I have friends who travel constantly. They're always on the road. They're constantly going between places and I I just can't do it. It's just too exhausting for me. It takes a lot of time, right, to organize everything and to constantly be thinking about the next place you're going to and the flights and the trains and whatever you need to book and the visas or whatever. So I'm at the point as well where I, I think the perfect thing for me would be to have a base somewhere and then go traveling for like a few weeks here and there or a couple of months here and there and have somewhere to come back to. So when you were doing the house hacking that you're talking about in the US in Rhode Island, and I love New England, by the way, (laughs) that's one of my favorite places. So you said you had a room in the house. So were you renting it out the whole year and then you could go back and stay or how does that work? Yeah. So there's a lot of different strategies to do it. The way that I did the property that I bought was three different units kind of stacked on top of each other. So the first floor was one unit second floor. So what I did was I was renting out the two other units. And then I did have a roommate for about half the time that I owned the property in my unit. All the units were two bed, two bath. So I always kept at least one unit or one bedroom in my unit for me to kind of come back to and also leave kind of those physical belongings that I wasn't bringing with me. Exactly. It's all the stuff as well. I've got mine in a storage unit at the moment. And it's like, I feel really bad. I've just abandoned it for (laughs) For years, I'm like, I'm sorry, I will get you out at some point. (laughs) And you mentioned the co-livings. I love co-livings as well. I've stayed in a few. I really love the whole atmosphere, the whole ethos. You're there with lots of digital nomads from all over the world. So you can learn from them, learn about their backgrounds, all that good stuff. And I wanted to ask you about the one you mentioned in Belize, because you said it was for over a month during the pandemic and you were with 40 plus other remote workers. So can you tell me about this? I didn't stay at any during the pandemic. So I was that a different experience? Or what was that like? Yeah, absolutely. So during the pandemic was when I sold my property. So at the end of 2020. So for me, I didn't really have a choice. I was kind of doing midterm accommodations anyways, which meant that I was bouncing around a bit between countries, coming back to the US sometimes to see family, things like that. So I was kind of already in that, I don't want to say limbo state, but I was already traveling and like booking out short and long-term midterm accommodation. So yeah, so with the the community, I found them online, right? Like I knew nobody and I just booked it that way. Usually when I'm looking at things like this, it's because I know another traveler who's been here, who stayed with them, that kind of thing. So when I booked it, I really felt like I was taking a risk, even though I had tried other co-living places before. But it was kind of like the this kind of divine timing. I was staying in an Airbnb in Florida when I found this and I was able to get like a really great flight down to Belize. And Belize had just opened up again for tourism. So they shut down for, I think, at least a year during the pandemic. They weren't really having any travelers come through. I believe it was completely shut down for a period of time there. And even when they opened up, there were just very few folks who were traveling at that time for at least like six months after that. And this was, I think, in 2021 still. But when that happened, I booked it, booked my flight, and I ended up having the most incredible experience there. I think at the time when I was there, it was called Umaya, but I believe they've kind of rebranded to Noma Collective. So for anyone who's (laughs) trying to Google like the name of the organization who was running this, I believe it's Noma Collective now. And when I got there, there were 40 plus other remote workers, A lot of folks, this was their first time working remotely because during the pandemic, their careers shifted. Some of them started working on their own businesses. So there was a lot of really fun collaboration between folks. At least every week, we would have one of us kind of present on a topic that we enjoy talking about, that we have a lot of expertise in. So it was a good way to kind of just share different learnings, 
learn about a lot of different topics. And then the lifestyle there was just incredible, right? Like you can kind of imagine staying. I was in Placencia, Belize, which is kind of like that peninsula off of the coast of Belize. So you can imagine just kind of a tropical paradise, (laughs) eating out on the beach in the evening, uh, just like beautiful ocean views. We would go snorkeling together. We would plan trips to hike waterfalls, things like that. But the piece that I always come back to is that just that community was so strong that I stayed in touch with so many of these folks. For example, flown to Mexico City to visit one of my friends who I met there and just like really long lasting connections during this really weird kind of limbo time for a lot of folks where I think community and connection was a little bit hard to find. Mm, definitely. And that's one of the reasons I started going. I'd done like one co-living pre-pandemic, but that's one of the reasons I started going to co-livings when the world opened up again, because like everyone was craving that community, that connection. And you kind of get it automatically when you go to <laughs> somewhere like a co-living. And you're right. I've made so many great friends who I've met up with since, who I'm going traveling with, who I like flew to different countries to hang out with. And yeah, you were already kind of on the same level with so many of these people. You already have so much in common. You already can relate in a way that maybe you can't relate to people back home who don't travel and work, you know, and that kind of thing. And it's definitely a great place to meet people who share the same values as you completely agree with that. I believe you worked remotely in the Maldives as well for a few weeks. And the Maldives is definitely on my travel bucket list. So can you tell me about this? Is it hard to work there whenever it looks so beautiful and it must be very distracting? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I think about this a lot. I get this question a ton because just as a remote worker, people are like, oh, you're in, you know, Hawaii, (laughs) Belize. Is it hard to focus? Something that was really great about the Maldives, I mean, double-edged sword, right, was that the time difference was so off from my team's based on the West Coast and most of my clients are in the US. So I was quite far a bit ahead of time in the Maldives, which pros and cons, right? It can be difficult to make that transition, which is why... I usually am like, I would advise someone to stay for at least two weeks if they're able to when they are working in off time zone, whether it's Maldives, Asia, wherever else, right? Because it can be hard to adjust to. But the nice thing is that I had my mornings, my afternoons free to kind of experience the island and the beach and snorkeling and diving and all of the awesome activities that make the Maldives such a, an enticing destination for so many people. So I think that was kind of one piece that Took a lot of adjusting, but at the same time, it was kind of a nice thing because like I got to eat my breakfast kind of on my balcony and listen to the waves, that kind of thing. But this was part of a around the world trip where I started from the US with my partner and we slow traveled like through Europe. And then we were looking at going from where we were in Greece over to Southeast Asia. So we we knew we were going to go to Thailand, but there's no there were no direct flights from where we were. So we were looking at it and we were able to find an actually very affordable flight to Malé, the capital of the Maldives. And we were like, I think we can make this work. So I did a ton of research looking at places to stay because as a remote worker, like Wi-Fi is kind of like one of the basic necessities, right? It's funny to say, but um, it really is when you're like, this is how I make my income and I need this to be liable. So I think that was the biggest part of like my research before I, I left for that trip was just like, can we make this work from like a, a work perspective? Both my partner and I work remotely. So it was it was very, very important to do that. And I feel like I got a little lucky with finding this place. They had a couple of Google reviews about specifically about the Wi-Fi from other folks who were working there. And they had a page on their site about how if you are working remotely here, we'll set you up with another desk and like we'll make it more comfortable for you, that kind of thing. So I was like, okay. Like they've had other folks. This isn't like a new concept for them. So I felt much more comfortable going there. And thankfully it was like, it was a really incredible experience. The time zone is always tough when I'm working, but we got to do so many different things. I went scuba diving for the first time, liked it so much, went two other times and pretty much went snorkeling every day and just kind of was there to really like experience the nature that they have to offer there. Mm, that sounds amazing. And I, yeah, you mentioning about the reviews and things these days, especially when there's so many digital nomads about, 
definitely look at the reviews because if there are any digital nomads who have been they're like all their reviewers about the height the speed of the wi-fi and like a lot of these places have started putting like a little image of the wi-fi speed in there because they know that it's so important to people and the desk thing yes. like so many places don't have a desk and you just end up sort of sitting on the bed and working so like looking for things like very simple things like wi-fi a desk a good chair very important and i was going to ask you about that around the world trip with your partner because you said you'd done a lot of solo travel, traveling with friends and things like this. And this was eight months, did you say? So what was it like traveling with your partner? And did you organize absolutely everything yourselves? Or did you do any, you know, have any help with that? Yeah, it's very different traveling with a partner than when you're solo. And I think the biggest thing for me is that I was so used to doing everything on my own in terms of the planning, right? Because there is a lot of legwork that comes into slow travel, right? You're committing to be somewhere for at least four weeks, especially when you're working. It's not like that easy to just kind of pick up and change where you're staying or, or change locations or jump on a plane, that kind of thing. It just takes a lot more planning effort. So having somebody else to split the initial brain work and planning and really like the emotional load of just like, where are we going to go? And and what do we want to do kind of thing was a huge relief and like very different for me. So I think that was like a big plus. And then, of course, like having somebody who you love to share different experiences with is, I wouldn't say it's better, but it's definitely, it's definitely very different. It was really cool to be able to travel for this long together. So I think kind of those two things there were huge. And then I think that if this had been both of, or even one of our first times doing like extended stays outside of our home country, I think it would have been hugely helpful to work with someone or even just to bounce ideas off of, right? Because it does take a lot of research to plan something like this. We went to, I think, four or five different countries in that time. So you can imagine how much, even just between the accommodation and making it a meaningful experience for you, right? Like, what do we want to do in Vietnam, for example? Like, do we want to make this more of like a culinary experience? Like, are we interested in getting handmade clothing made, right? There's like so many different pieces that can really impact your experience. So in our case, we booked it all of our, all ourselves and did all of the planning ourselves. So of course it took like a lot of time, but it's something that I'm kind of a nerd about. So like, I really love researching destinations. I will go into the subreddit threads and like read about what people did and, and what they wish they did and like their trip reviews, things like that. So, and just talking to friends, right? Because having been working remotely for eight years, I have a lot of different friends who are kind of spread out and have had different experiences in these in these places. So for example, in Thailand, I do a little meetup with my really good friend there in Chiang Mai, and we kind of overlapped by at least a couple of weeks. So that also helps, right? When you have someone who's like, oh, I lived here for three years, you know, back in 2015. So like hugely helpful. So I think those are some factors that made us feel pretty confident in like being able to plan this trip and do it all of ourselves. Yeah, I'm the same. I love planning stuff. I love coming up with like an itinerary. I think it's like half the fun for me. Like <laughs> I enjoy that part just as much as I enjoy the actual going. <laughs> Definitely. So you mentioned, so obviously you were going around the world with your partner then. And I believe before that you were in a long distance relationship. Is that right? Is that like while you were traveling? How hard was that? What kind of challenges did that bring up? Because I think that is what puts a lot of people off traveling. They worry about that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. My partner and I did this for three years. We're both from the US, we're both US citizens, but he was working in Germany and this was overlapped with the pandemic, right? So during the pandemic, as you know, a lot of countries shut down to tourists and because we're not married, I would have to travel on a, on a tourist visa, right? So that of course was like, I think the hardest part was just not knowing and that kind of anxiety around like, Am I going to be able to get into the country? That kind of thing. I remember being on the plane. I had a layover in London. I spent a weekend there solo, just kind of exploring the city before my flight to Germany. London and Ireland, both great like hopping off points for me since I was transiting from the US to Germany. And as a US citizen, I could only spend 90 days in Germany, right? In like in that 180 day period. So there's like the Schengen visa rules for us U.S. citizen folks. So it was like every 90 days I would kind of be spending in Germany and then I would go to Mexico or Belize or back to the U.S. or somewhere else in Europe that was outside of the Schengen zone. So 
that was honestly navigating the visa piece was a huge headache. One time I was in Germany, I remember sitting on the couch and I had only been there for a few weeks. And I was like, let me just check. Like, I'm going to run the Schengen calculator and just make sure that like, I'm good for like at least the next month and a half. And it turns out that that weekend, my days were running out because I had overlapped with a couple week period from my last trip. And I just like, I just hadn't run the calculations. And that was incredibly difficult. That was really hard. So having to kind of change my plans last minute, but you can also imagine kind of the just emotional piece around that, like having to say goodbye. I never want to have to say goodbye at the Stuttgart airport ever again. No. <laughs> if I never have to go there ever again, <laughs> I will be happy. So yeah, I think just the emotional piece, just being really hard, a lot of goodbyes and then navigating that visa piece. We did get really lucky during the pandemic because Germany and I want to see a few other countries had what they called like the sweetheart visa, where if you could prove that you were in a longer term relationship with somebody else who was not a, a resident of the country, then they could buy and enter. But it was a little confusing because it wasn't an official document. There was no official paperwork. So what I would do is I would show up to the airport, book my flight with a, and I would come with a binder of photos of us in Germany, of proof of his residency, his passport copies, driver's licenses. They wanted to sometimes see like text message threads, things like that. It was crazy. So I'd show up with this binder and, you know, I'd be flying out of, let's say like Boston in the U.S. If I was coming from the U.S. and checking in, they would be very confused because they were like, you are not a resident nor citizen of Germany. Like, what is this binder kind of thing? So they would have to kind of get check in and get approval because nobody knew what this like sweetheart application visa was. And it was very much kind of like fly at your own risk kind of thing. But thankfully, I can say I hadn't been turned away once at the border. So that was huge. And yeah, to answer your question, I think the pandemic, those three years, I think would have been like even more <laughs> stressful had Germany not enabled that in our case. Wow, that sounds stressful, <laughs> definitely. And yeah, <laughs> having to be so organized with the binder and like looking at text messages and everything, that's, yeah, that's a lot. And I get what you mean with the Schengen calculator, because since Brexit, we also have the 90 day rule, even though we live in the UK. Mm, that's right. So yeah, I totally get that. And like looking at the Schengen app and like, <laughs> being like, oh, wait, do I have enough like time left? Or do I need to go to a different country? And yeah, it's, right. a, it's a lot to organize and get your head around, definitely. We've kind of talked about this already, but we both know the transformative power that travel has in general, but how has travel helped you transform personally? Yes. I think for me, the biggest thing is that it's increased my confidence, right? Because when you go somewhere for the first time, especially when you don't know anybody and you've kind of planned this trip yourself, you're really kind of forced to take control of your experience and and also your lifestyle, right? In this case, when I'm staying for at least a month at a time. And I think starting kind of that travel journey eight plus years ago has really increased just my self-confidence and my ability to kind of navigate different situations that I never, never thought I would be in. There is nothing like navigating a new city in a foreign country in a new language to kind of boost your confidence. And every doing anything is kind of like a big win sometimes, right? Like going to the grocery store and getting your groceries for the week. Sometimes you're like, wow, I can't believe I just did that <laughs> kind of thing. So absolutely on the confidence side as well. I think too, in terms of like defining the vision that I have for my life and like my ability to get more clarity around that, which I think is important, you know, for anybody to do is, is just have different experiences so that you can use that to better inform the kind of life that you want to live. So all of these experiences that I've had traveling are helping me kind of inform and plan like the kind of life that I want to live one year, five year, 10 plus years from now. Yeah, I love that so much. And yeah, the confidence thing absolutely is the main thing it's given me like, once you can navigate around a place where you you'd say you don't know anyone, you don't know the language. And you know, you can do that. It goes okay, you survive, <laughs> like you figure out you can do literally anything like anything else back home just seems not as huge anymore like you can do these amazing things and it really does give you confidence to do everything else in your life and like you say help you like with clarity around life purpose and what you want out of life it's definitely done that for me as well so completely agree there too 
So you mentioned earlier your business, Money Life Mentor. So can you tell me more about this, what you offer and what made you want to start this business in the first place? I just want to interrupt this awesome podcast episode for a moment to tell you about Write Your Life, the ultimate life hack for achieving your dreams by Jessica Grace Coleman, a book that teaches you how to design your dream life and then go live it. Life is what you make it. Life is what you write it to be. And you can write whatever you want. Let me show you how. The Write Your Life method gives you all the tools and techniques you need to identify your ambitions, plan your goals, and ultimately achieve all your wildest dreams, all while having fun and getting creative. And you don't need to be a writer to benefit from the Write Your Life method. This book can help anyone, anywhere design their ultimate dream lifestyle. Get it now from Amazon or head to www.traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash books. You'll also get a digital copy completely free when you sign up to the Flip the Script Academy at traveltransformationcoach.com forward slash academy, where we teach you that life is short. So let's make sure it's nothing short of amazing. And now let's get back to the Travel Transformation Podcast. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll kind of start with why I started this business. And what it comes down to is that in my early 20s, kind of like that, in college and then right after college period of my life, I realized just how important understanding personal finance and investing was. And I've kind of used that. And I went really deep in my early 20s on educating myself because really none of us learn about investing and finance growing up, right? Like we we are not taught this in school. So I kind of went through this like really deep discovery period of like, this is really important. I'm not sure why. I don't know why I didn't learn this in school, but like I'm going to self-educate myself over the next few years. And I just, I kept going and went really deep on different subjects with it. And I found that my ability to use money in a way that allowed me to create the life that I wanted gave me so much more freedom, so much more independence. And honestly, the reason I started the company is because I had friends and people in my network who were asking me like, hey, how do I do that? Like, I see you going on these trips. I see you, you're able to have this house, but you also work remotely. And I saw you were just in Thailand or whatever it is, right? And they're like, how can I do that kind of thing? So that's really how it started is that I started just learning about kind of the financial challenges and goals that people in my network and my friends and family were having. And then I realized like, oh, like I have a system, like this system that I use for myself, it works for other people. So that's why a few years ago, I started Money Life Mentor. and What I really do in the company is I help usually busy young professionals. I help them figure out how much money they can free up every month and then understand how to best allocate their income so that they can create a life with increased freedom, flexibility, and in most cases, travel. Mm. I love this. And you're right. We don't learn anything about this at school, like nothing (laughs) at all, which seems ridiculous to me. So can we talk a bit about FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early? So for people who are listening who might not have heard about this, might not know much about it, can you explain what it is? And then can you talk about it maybe in relation to travelers and like nomads in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So FIRE, financial independence, retire early, it has a lot of different definitions, a lot of different subsets, but really what it comes down to is creating the ability for yourself to retire before traditional retirement age, right, of 65, 67. So whether that's age 30, which some folks have managed to do, 40, 55, even 60, right? Giving yourself kind of that gift of five years in retirement to do whatever you would like during that decade of your life. So most folks in the FIRE movement, they really strive to save and invest as much of their monthly income as possible. And really like the way the math works out is the larger percentage of your income that you're able to invest that's going to cut down on your timeline where you could potentially retire early. And what is coast fi and slow fi? Because you mentioned this and I've never heard of these terms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the reason I mentioned them is because there's no single path, right? Or like right way to achieving fire, which that's a big part of what's always fascinated me and attracted me to this movement, right? Is that there's there's so many different ways to do it. The kind of traditional, like if we look back, maybe like, I don't know, 2005, 2006, when kind of like the early fire bloggers were coming out, a lot of the ethos around fire was 
I'm earning six figures. I'm a software engineer and usually like white male. And they were like, we're going to try to invest, you know, 70 to 85% of our income and keep our savings rate super high and like cut out our spending kind of thing. And I'm going to grind for 10 years, right? That was like a lot of the kind of early part of the FIRE movement. And what I think has been so incredible over the last you know, decade, maybe more, is that a lot of different folks have kind of adopted this movement. And there's now like a lot of different subsets of FIRE. And the FIRE movement itself is kind of transforming to kind of go along with this more like slow FIRE concept, like what I like to call slow FIRE, which is like, you're also enjoying the journey, right? So you, you're you focused on retiring early. You might even have a goal around that, right? So maybe it's like retiring at age 50, for example, which for so many folks would be a huge gift. But instead of kind of striving and trying to you know earn as much as possible for 10 years straight and like working 50 to 70 hours a week between full-time work and side hustle, whatever it is, they're kind of spreading it out a bit more. So they might say, okay, I'm going to try to get to this point where I have my first $250,000 invested in my retirement accounts, and then I'm going to go down to three days a week, right? And then kind of coast. So Coast Fire is this version of Fire that requires you to have enough invested or saved so that even without adding to your investments, your portfolio will grow to support your retirement. So essentially, by the time that you turn that traditional retirement age of 65, you'll have enough to live on, right? So you could imagine if you're maybe 30 and you have, and you started with this, you know, seven years ago and you have gotten to that 200, 250K invested, you can kind of run the math and see, okay, I'm not running the math right now, but you might say, okay, this is around like $1.1 million when I hit 65, 67. So I'm going to kind of take my foot off the gas pedal, right? Maybe I'm going to make a career change to something that I've always wanted to do. Or maybe I can go back to doing contract work where I'm doing 24 hours a week instead of 40 to 50 kind of thing. So it just kind of gives you more freedom to make life choices without that pressure of saving for retirement. Mm, I'm learning so much. I did not know about post buy or slow <laughs> buy. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay. So so how do you personally balance everything in terms of, because obviously you, you've talked about this, in terms of your finances, looking at the long-term financial priorities, but also still wanting to prioritize travel and having all these amazing experiences. How do you sort of approach that? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it's just looking at what season of my life I'm in. So in my early 20s, it you know, the first couple of years out of school, I was paying off debt and that was like my number one financial focus. So really getting clear on my numbers has helped with no matter what season of life I'm in, right? So like understanding what my average monthly income is, my average monthly expenses, looking at my purchases on a monthly basis, like does this actually bring me joy or should this go into my travel fund kind of thing, right? Because for me, travel and experiences are what bring me the most fulfillment and satisfaction they're what I like to share with other people kind of thing. It's my favorite thing to spend on. So if I'm looking at, you know, buying like, I don't know, something fancy, like a new phone or something, even though my phone works perfectly fine, I might kind of run the math and be like, oh, actually, you know, this would be much better suited for putting 50% in my vacation fund for the next trip I'm planning and then maybe half into my investments. And actually knowing how to run the math on that is so powerful, right? Being like, okay, if I don't spend this money on the new iPhone or whatever it is, but I invest it. Okay. I'm just going to use a simple calculator online. And like, here's what this is going to do for me when I'm 65. Like this is the money that I'm going to live off of. And I think like keeping that kind of in the back of my mind has been really powerful, especially in my twenties when I was a little bit more kind of nose to the grindstone, like building up that cushion to give me more freedom. But yeah, I think it definitely comes down to looking at your numbers, having clarity around what your goals are so that you can make sure that the numbers actually align to those, right? Because a lot of us say that we want X or Y, but when I look at the financials, it's like, okay, but most of your money is going going to this and going to this. And you have like very, very low percentage going to these things that you say actually matter to you. It's so like, how can we better like align that? And I do that for myself, like every year, every month. Yeah, I think so many people, they think they know about their numbers, you know, they have this vague idea, but what, until you actually sit down and go through everything and then you're like, oh, actually, I'm spending quite a bit here. I didn't even realize it. And like, it seems such a simple exactly. thing, but so many people don't do it. And I've been guilty of this in the past as well. But yeah, get your 
head around your numbers, know exactly incoming, outgoing, and like you say, your goals and your priorities as well. Like, what do you want to prioritize? And are you actually prioritizing that in terms of your finances? Because a lot of people probably aren't, <laughs> even if they think they are. So do you have any finance tips for digital nomads or people who might be considering the digital nomad lifestyle? Yeah, I think for anybody who's looking to be a digital nomad or who already is, simplifying your personal finances as much as possible is going to help you immensely. So there are so many thousands and thousands of financial products out there, right between bank accounts, investment accounts, CDs, like in England or wherever you're a citizen of, there's like so many different types of accounts across the board. So I think the more that you can simplify your finances, the better. So looking at your bank accounts, right? Like, is my bank actually serving me or is it kind of the other way around? Am I paying fees with my bank? Is it better if I switch? Looking for options to kind of consolidate, I think is a big part when we're talking about simplifying your financial system as much as possible. And then also automating whenever that's feasible, right? So talking about kind of like paying ourselves first, which really just means like, are you investing for your future instead of kind of looking at your budget in a way that's, okay, I have all these expenses and debt. And then kind of like whatever's left over, I might try at the end of the month to put a little bit towards my savings goals or to investments. But if you can automate that, right, especially like maybe when you get paid, even just having starting with like a little bit, like 2%, 3%. And if you can slowly kind of increase that as your income increases, that can go a really long way, right? Because as digital nomads, we are, we're just busy, right? Sometimes travel planning feels like it's a part-time job, <laughs> Like you said, like even if you enjoy putting those hours into planning your trip, it still takes a lot of time. So wherever we can simplify and automate, that's going to be hugely helpful. Mm, definitely. Simplify and automate, I think, is a good rule to live by anywhere in your life anyway. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. Totally. <laughs> Great. Okay. And I asked you where your favorite places in the world are. And you mentioned Belize, um, which we talked about. And you also mentioned Crete in Greece. So can you tell me why this place is so special to you? Yes. And this was part of my eight month trip with my partner where we spent two months in Crete. We stayed in the city of Hanya. It's a beautiful city on the island, right? You can just kind of picture like views of the Mediterranean and just that beautiful clear water. We were there in the fall, so it was much less busy, just less folks there. I'm sure that you're the same, Jessica, but I love traveling in like that shoulder season. I feel like it gives you like just a different glimpse of what it's like to live there and, and just kind of spend time there. But really all aspects of Crete, I loved. The food was amazing. We did vineyard, winery tours, just so much incredible community too. I started going to a yoga class twice a week and it was like all locals and then me. And I just, it just kind of gave me a different feeling of like being kind of accepted into the community for like my short stint there. And there was also a really cool remote worker community as well. There's, I believe there's only one co-work space in Hanya, but it, I think it was called Work Hub. And they have this WhatsApp group and that let me kind of get connected to a lot of the other digital nomads there. And they do kind of meetups at least once a month, usually every other week. So that was really interesting. And that was part of my trip that I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to tap into because Hanya is like a much smaller city, right? So like if you go to Bangkok, much easier to kind of meet other travelers, other remote workers. But I was really surprised at how how nice like this close-knit remote worker community was that I found there. So really all things, like I love the Greek culture, the food's incredible. Just in the island, it's pretty cool because if you drive for even 20 minutes inland, they have mountains there. So they have like the White Mountains in Crete. And it's really cool to go from the beach you can go from like the beach at the start of your day, early afternoon, and then you can like have lunch in the mountains. And to me, that was just such a, such a really cool thing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that does sound good. I don't actually think I've been to Greece at all. So it's definitely on my list. And yeah, that sounds great. And you made a good point there. Like you might think there's no co-living places. So there's no other remote workers, but sometimes if you can find a co-working place, they often have like a community element to it. Like you say, they do events, they might have a WhatsApp group. So definitely look that up wherever you go. Even if there's no actual co-living place, you might still be able to sort of tap into that community. So that's a really good point as well. Okay, so I've got two last quick questions. 
first of all where can people find and follow you online i'll put them in the show notes as well and is there anything else you want to mention or any last message you want to get across before we go yeah absolutely i think in terms of where to find me you can follow me on linkedin i post a lot on there so i'm brooke tomasetti i'm also on instagram at money life mentor and then in terms of what to leave folks with i just love coming back to the fact that none of us were taught about finance growing up so there are no dumb questions when it comes to personal finance. Yeah, definitely. I think some people are sort of put off the whole thing because they don't want to appear stupid by asking these questions, even if they're, you know, like grown adults. But like you say, if you don't get taught it at school, there's no reason why you should know much about it unless, you know, there's someone like you who actually went and educated themselves. So definitely don't feel stupid by asking questions or by starting to learn about it in your 30s or 40s or beyond or wherever like you know you can still learn a lot that can really really help you so yeah that's great great tips and yeah great talking to you about travel and all things transformation so thank you so much for coming on today yeah thank you so much for having me no problem thank you for listening to the travel transformation podcast with me jessica grace coleman if you enjoyed this episode, I would really appreciate it if you could please subscribe, rate and review and spread the word because it's my mission to help as many people as possible to flip the script on their lives and transform through travel. And remember, life is short, so let's make sure it's nothing short of amazing. Until next time, I'll catch you on the flip side.